And I'm just going to read a short verse, and um, once I read through it, I'll have you read it with me, okay? It's, it's from Psalm 62, verse 2. It says, He alone is my rock, my deliverance, and my high tower. Nothing will shake me. Amen? Amen? So let's say it out loud together. I'll say the first part. You repeat it. He alone is my rock, he alone is my, rock. my deliverance, my deliverance. And, my and my high tower. Nothing, Nothing. will shake me. Shake me. Hallelujah. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's nourishment to our spirit. You said we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we just feed on your word today, Lord. Thank you for Holy Spirit being in our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the word come alive to us. And, Lord, help us even in these difficult days with 37 days to the election and all the contention streaming around us. Lord, we thank you that you're the rock that we stand on. We will not be shaken. Lord, we'd make that this decree today. We will not be shaken in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead. You can sit down. And thanks for um, being flexible because that's a big part of a prophetic church is that you have to be willing to change things on the fly. We put all this beautiful money into a beautiful chapel, which we're happy to use again, but... It was very clear after we had the Chuck Pierce meeting here on that Friday night not long ago, and there was a couple hundred people here, and we didn't have to wear the mask outside because we could stay far enough apart that people really preferred that over being in the church building and, and being um, 100 people at a time with the mask on. So for as long as we can do this, we're going to keep doing it outside. I, don't, I, I never minded going to a football game in October. I would wear a sweater, so you might need to be a little hardy to come out in a few weeks. But I don't know. Look at today. This is like Indian summer, right? It's just gorgeous. So we're going to take it a week at a time and just see how the Lord leads and keep on praying that this plague will depart and that, you know, some kind of logic will come back into the world and we'll be able to try to get back to some kind of normal way of living. Amen? So what the Lord showed me today, in addition to this verse of Psalm 62.2, he alone is my rock and my deliverance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nothing will shake me. Nothing will shake me. He's my high tower. Nothing will shake me. We're in a very shaking time right now. And you very much have to be centered on the word of God and on your relationship with God and be aware if he's trying to show you things that haven't been obvious to you before. Because if you think about a hurricane, we have one not that long ago. What do you see on the ground after a hurricane if you're looking in your backyard? You see a bunch of dead limbs. Because they were too loose to hang on. And the Bible has in several different places, it says anything that can be shaken will be shaken. And that's what's happening for a lot of us for the first time in, in our lives. We're feeling like a war-like condition. Maybe not so much immediately in Basking Ridge, but if you lived in Lexington, I think it was Lexington, Kentucky, where the latest riots were, right, um, over the Breonna Taylor uh, verdict and, and how many other cities, Portland, Seattle, there'd be so many other cities where these riots are going on and people are losing their businesses and they, they, it seems like there's just a real rage happening in America right now. And if you're old enough to remember the contested election that we had when uh, the Bush-Gore election was 2004, which is 16 years ago, it had to be settled by the Supreme Court. And it was settled by the Supreme Court. And there were no riots, if you remember. America was in a very different place then. And I don't know what's going to happen. I, I can only pray for my country like you all can pray for your country. And if there is a contested election, let's pray that there won't be riots and a civil war. Amen? And I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying I've continued the fast. I don't know about any of you, but we did a 21-day fast. And I haven't stopped fasting because I've been feeling a really heavy burden for our country and for our leaders and, and not picking a side either because nobody wants to live with this kind of environment. And I'm sure COVID has a lot to do with it. I'm sure a lot of us are more uh, easily agitated than we might be normally. But like I said, if it's shaking and it's on the ground, that means it was loose to begin with. So don't look at that as a bad thing. You know, last week I talked about God disciplines us because he loves us. And if he didn't love us, then it wouldn't be a good father-son or father-daughter relationship. So the word he gave me is that we're going to win the war in the second heaven. Okay? Can you make that declaration? I'm going to win the war in the second heaven. All right? And 
just so you know, I have a scriptural basis for that language. In Revelation 21.1, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, earth for the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Okay? So that's the atmosphere that we live in. That's this immediate atmosphere. God says he's a very present help. He's right here available to us in this atmosphere if we avail ourselves of that power that he wants to give us. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, I know a man in Christ, a lot of you know he was talking about himself, right, who was caught up to the third heaven. And he was with the Lord in the third heaven. Right? And he said, the things I saw there were so dramatic in my language, I couldn't even say it. I can't even tell you in words what I saw, but I was caught up into that third heaven where the throne room is. And many people have described that throne room, having died, gone to heaven, and come back again. And, and there's a real similarity between a lot of the descriptions of the people that were authentic about that. So where the war is, is in the second heaven. Hi, Kathy. Good to see you. I don't recognize you with the uh, sunglasses on. Everybody say hi to Kathy Bixell. She's a minister down in South Jersey. Been with our church many times. Spoken at our church. Appreciate you. Keep the faith. Keep doing what you're doing. So this second heaven, if you want to think back to Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, the angel comes to him and says, Lord heard you from the first day you were praying. Your prayers were heard, but I've been in battling for 21 days to come down here. And as soon as you said it, we heard it, but there's been a war going on in this middle heaven, in this middle second heaven. So what I'm warning you, but what I've been feeling really kind of a heaviness about while I've been continuing the fast is that the war intensity in the second heaven is going to increase, but we said it in Psalm 62, he alone is my rock, okay? I will not be shaken. And the more you make that confession in this decade of the decree, the better. Because your own spirit needs to hear you when you start to get shaken. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of descriptions. I heard one this morning of families getting into these major arguments over whatever, political, okay? And I don't want to get into all that. Um, really, I don't. I just do want to encourage you, though, if you're thinking about the Supreme Court nomination, to do your homework, you know, if you want to uh, want to comment about it. We, we passed around among our team, our leadership team, a video of Amy Barrett, I forget her middle name, but the, Coney Barrett that is being nominated now by President Trump, strong Christian. And, and the thing that really struck me, really kind of brought me to tears uh, it, when I heard her testimony is that she has seven children, two of them are adopted. She had five and wanted to adopt a, a, a second child from Haiti, had already adopted a child from Haiti. And then there was a paperwork problem. In November of that year, she was supposed to get this child. And they said, no, there's too many problems with the paperwork. Then uh, Christmas came, and the earthquake hit Haiti. And then it's January. In the meantime, she found out she was now pregnant with her sixth child. <laughs> so they had said no, but now they called and said, well, now do you want the baby? Because now you can have the baby. <laughs> And she was like, I don't know. Let me get back to you. i got to pray about this one. So she said, I walked outside. She was a professor at Notre Dame University, and she walked out into the park. It happened to be a park that was in the cemetery on the campus. And I'm, I'm sure she didn't say this, but the thought was going through her head, if we don't adopt this child, he may die in Haiti. And the orphanages down there were not in such good shape, as you can imagine. And unequivocally, she heard the Lord tell her, there's nothing greater you can do with your life than raise a child. <laughs> so they did it. They adopted the child. His name is John Peter. And I think what we were hearing this morning is that same kind of indication of this immense enormity of the value that God places on every single life. Amen. And it's partly why people are upset right now about racism, and rightly so. Nobody should be mistreated. Okay, but let's not let the medicine be worse than the disease. I'll just kind of leave it at that without trying to get political. But, but also don't think that the church is not, to, is not supposed to comment on the culture. Amen. Because we are. Amen. The word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the way we apply it changes as the culture changes. Right. And how we need it. All right? So you all good? Nobody's ready to leave yet? <laughs> Happy to hear that. I would encourage you to continue to fast. <clears throat> OK? 
okay? What you say, Nate? Say it again. Got the green light from Nate. That's good. <laughs> lift up the country. Lift up our heritage. Lift up the, the veterans that have died in, in honor of the freedom that we have, the freedom to do this right here today. It's not called hate speech. It's called freedom of speech that we have. So enough said, right? Just pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, what will he do? Heal from, he hear from heaven and heal our land. Woo. Trisha and I were down in Texas. I understand when you travel, you know, there's a two-week quarantine that you put yourself into voluntarily. I've been avoiding contact with anybody, but I didn't feel led um, not to be here today. I could still keep my distance from everybody and um, you know, pretty much work alone during the week, so it's not like I'm, I'm interacting with people. And we real, I was really shifted by being back down in Gloria Zion again. That's our home turf. And if you remember, I've talked about Eleazar in the Old Testament. He was one of David's mighty men. And the thing that's notable about him, in addition to being a brave warrior, he fought so hard in one of the battles that his hand froze to the sword. You remember that picture? And it was like they had to peel his fingers off the sword. And the last six months has been so contentious and so difficult, partly in the natural for us, in that we were moving at the same time that the COVID restrictions were on us and we were trying to get the chapel refinished. So it's like, really, life's not complicated enough. Now we're going to do a construction project when we don't know when the deliveries are coming in or when the men are going to show up or whatever. And God got us through it. You know, it's, it's really been the year of the Lord's favor. But there was something about, thank you, thank you. There's been something about going down to glory of Zion and, and getting reset with our home tribe. There was a couple thousand people in what they call the miracle box. And again, if you remember when Chuck Pierce was here, he said where we're going is going to be called a miracle center. Amen. How many are believing for that here? Yeah. What about right now today? Yeah. If you need a miracle, we don't have to wait till we go in the chapel, okay? God is here. He's with us. We're two or three. We're gathered in his name, and he's here with us. Amen. So we want to see signs, wonders, and miracles. Not because we're great, because he's great. Amen. All right? So when you're in your tribe, you get refreshed. And that's what I want to do for you guys today. I want today to be a time of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. And yes, it could be difficult in the next 37 days to the election, and it could be difficult after the election. But I'm not moved by that. I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be put into a fear mode. I'm going to be centered on God. And that's not boastful. That's learn, lessons learned the hard way. Because I know when I do get rattled and I'm emotionally hijacked, I make really bad decisions. Right. And when I'm not praying and I'm not waiting and hearing from the Lord, I make bad decisions. So that's my encouragement to you is take advantage of the unfair advantage you have inside you called Holy Spirit. And keep the lines of communication open with him. When Paul said, pray at all times, that's what he was talking about. Be aware of the Lord's presence. He doesn't go where he's not welcome. You have to tell him, I want to hear from you. He doesn't force himself in on, on you. He's not breaking down the door for you. He'll hunt you down and make himself real to you like we sang today. But you have to let him know that you want to know what he has to say. And if we're not doing that, that could be pride. And that leads to a lot of problems. All right, so when I got saved, I wasn't taught how to pray the way my wife was taught how to pray. And then we got married, and I saw a different version of, of a person's prayer life, and I liked her version better than the one I had. Mine, it was me doing most of the talking. She was doing more listening than talking when, when I watched her. And I realized I was only getting part of the picture. Yes, you can make your request known to God, I know James said you have not because you ask not, but there's another direction that prayer is talking about, and that's hearing the voice of the Lord, all right? Not because, like Lisa alluded to, we're not adding to Scripture. We're listening to the direction of a loving Father. If he wasn't talking to us, he wouldn't be a good Father. But are we listening? And have we been able to discern the voice of the Lord? And that's, that's really where I'm going to go in Scripture today. Just two different portions of Scripture well, three, actually. 
Ephesians chapter 6, a lot of you know it because it says, we wrestle not what? Against, right. How many have read that verse before? And you know it really well. And you know the principle, but it's not always easy to apply the principle because when you're in an argument with somebody, it could feel like you're wrestling with that person. Well, what was Paul telling us that we really are wrestling with? The principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the wickedness in dark places. There's a spiritual war going on, and it's right there described. And I really like it in the message. Eugene Peterson wrote it this way. God is strong, and he wants you strong. Amen. Look at somebody and say that. God is strong, and he wants you strong. All right, so take everything the master has set out for you. They're well-made weapons of the best materials. You don't have to tell them that. They're hearing me say it. And put them to use. So I think it's a really grieving thing to the Holy Spirit if we're not praying. Amen. He's like, I'm ready to tell you, but you have to ask. Because I want you to be in a humbled position to say, I need your help. Amen. And again, I'm just telling you, in my life, my wife modeled something that I really needed to learn because the world had taught me to count on my reasoning and my natural gifts. And that only gets you so far. And boy, you can end up in a ditch, spiritual ditch, really quickly because something could be a good idea but not a God idea. And again, that's what I learned, one of many things that I learned from her. So he said, you, you take everything the master has set out for you, those weapons are made with the best material, and put them to, to you so you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil wants to throw at you. This is for keeps. The battle that we're in is for keeps. It's a life or death fight to finish against the devil and all his angels. Now, not everybody likes to hear that. They don't like the warfare language in the Bible. What should I say? Tear that page out? No. It's real. But God is love. Yes, God is love. But Adam and Eve sinned. God is love, but Adam and Eve sinned. And we inherited that sin nature. And we got saved. Then we became members of God's army to fight against the evil that's in the world. And one book that we like to use is The Divine Conspiracy. So we're now in a godly divine conspiracy to defeat evil with the love of God. That's what we're here for. We're as ambassadors. We're not just waiting to die and go to heaven. We represent the kingdom. We're the ecclesia, if you've been hearing that word a lot lately. We go into a foreign culture, and we bring God's kingdom into that foreign culture, and we say, watch how God works, and you're going to want this because it's better than the sinful way that you're living. Not boastful at all, because we know, a lot of us anyway, know how bad that other culture was. And we're just grateful to be alive. He really did chase me down and find me in the pit and pull me up. Wow, I don't ever want to forget to be grateful for that. All right, so the last part of Ephesians 6 in the message says, Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. You believe that? Yes. Which is why you pray. And you say, Lord, I don't know what's coming my way today, but I know there's going to be tests, some from the world, some from my flesh, some even from you, Lord, because you're trying to discipline me, and I want to I pass the test. I don't want to be that double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. James just puts it right out there, doesn't he? That was from James 1.8 a couple weeks ago. And then he said, truth, righteousness, peace, peace, and faith are more than just words. They're weapons. I'll say it again. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout the rest of your life. Amen. And then he said, God's word is indispensable. In the same way, prayer is essential in the ongoing warfare. So if you take one thing away from this today, and somebody says, what did he preach about? You just say that I will not be shaken, and I'm going to keep on praying. Amen. Okay, that's, that's what we're saying. And, and we all have a freedom that we could easily take for granted. Okay, don't do that. Just really cherish the peace that we have as a church to be able to meet and, and have the freedom to discuss the Bible and the Word of God, okay? That's something worth praying about. That's worth persevering and, and continuing. He said, pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. 
And the, the argument I was hearing about today from one of the team members here who was just saying, yeah, we were having a discussion last night. It didn't end well. It turned into a political discussion. And, uh, you know, it got a little hostile. You know, and, and I get it. I understand that. But what would the enemy love to do? Right? Divide the church. If we're the force on the earth that is going to defeat hell, right? He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, Jesus said, not Peter's church, not Trisha's church, against the church of Christ in the earth. Amen. In Luke chapter 10, he said, a house divided cannot stand, Amen. right? He was talking about the argument they were trying to use that he was casting the devil out by the power of the devil. Doesn't even make sense, does it? And he said, why, why would the devil want to cast out the devil? A house divided can't stand. So if we're bickering with each other as the church, guess who's happy about that? Your enemy, the opponent. We only have so much time on this earth. Let's make the most of it. Let's fight for unity among ourselves. Are you allowed to have a different opinion? Yes. But should you respect other people? Yes. At all times, you can always respect them. If they're not being disrespectful to you, don't become the thing you hate in them. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. Some people are so hostile, they only know how to talk in an argument. And when they're berating you and defiling you and you don't fight back, they don't know what to do. It's like you're pulling the fuse out and they don't know where to go and they'll just calm down because you're not trying to meet them in the same spirit. That's part of what the Lord can give you. I have found myself in those moments say, Lord, I don't know what to say right now as they're talking. I know they're not finished yet, and I'm listening with this ear. <laughs> but I want to hear what you're saying in this ear. Show me what you see when you look at them. Because I want to see the angry little child in this 35-year-old adult that I'm talking to. There's an 8-year-old child in there who's not getting his way. I, I'm just making that up as I'm talking here. But that's what the Lord will do. And because you asked, he'll give you a picture and he'll give you, you open your mouth, he'll fill it. He'll put the words in. I'm telling you, this next season, we're going to need this big time. Now let's look at an example of people who were not hearing from the Lord, not praying at all times, that were in the church. A lot of you probably know where I'm going. It's 1 Corinthians 11. That was a very secular town. Most of the people that got saved there did not have the Jewish background. They didn't need to get delivered from a religious spirit but they needed deliverance from a lustful spirit and a pagan spirit, worshiping idols. They were very carnal, right? That's okay. I can relate to that one. And, and Paul is writing with a corrective word. He says, it's not good what I'm hearing about you, verse 17. When you meet together, it's bringing out the worst side of you instead of the best. First, I get this report on your divisiveness. You're competing with each other and you're criticizing each other. The best that can be said for that is that the testing process will bring truth out into the open and confirm it. That's the message again. What am I talking about? If other people are being contentious with you anywhere, but including in the church, you don't want to let the worst come out and say, wait a minute, no, we're here for each other. And, and there's people at different stages of their walk with the Lord. And, and the mature leaders of the church should be able to model a Christ-like attitude, right? And sometimes he was firm. And often he was merciful, and when he did speak the truth, he did it in love. These guys are not getting it yet. In 1 Corinthians, and Paul's talking to them, it's a young church, and he's like, wait a minute, you're coming together around the Lord's Supper, and you're arguing. That's wrong. That's not how this is supposed to be. So let's be extra intentional as the body of Christ to seek unity with each other. That's the place of commanded blessing. Psalm 133, you know that one? when brethren dwell together in unity. All right, and then he says in verse 20, I find that you're bringing your divisions into worship. How does that go? Ever been there? Ever been angry during worship and you're trying to lift hands and, and be encouraged by the guy who's leading? And you're like, all right, I'll lift my hands, but I sure don't feel like it because I'm still mad from the parking lot. Not that we have a personal example of that. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I'll let that one pass. But, you know, the parking lot can be one of the most secular places at a church, <laughs> at a church property. Just saying, you know, just saying. Not a good thing. 
We shouldn't be bringing out divisiveness with each other. We're bringing divisions to our worship. You come together and instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you're bringing in food from the outside and then a spirit of gluttony takes over. In church. See, they're still bringing a worldly attitude into the church. And he says, again, this is the message. Some people are left out from the food altogether. Others have to be carried out because they're too drunk to walk. And he said that. I can't believe it. Paul said, I can't believe it. Don't you have your own homes to eat in and drink in? But then he says this. This is a real, very sobering word. He says, why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? All right? So it might not be in worship. It might not be supper or getting drunk and all. But there are many ways that we really need to reflect the character of Christ when there's a lot of warring and shaking going on around us. We're supposed to be different. Can we just pray real quick and say, Lord, help me be different. In this time of shaking, I will not be shaken. You alone are my rock, my fortress, my high tower, and I will not be shaken. I'm telling you, that's going to be the most important thing you could do. The witness that you could give is have a Christ-like attitude in the midst of the contending that's going on. And then he said, after why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? He said, why would you shame God's poor? Because they were eating and drinking to themselves, and some of the people that were there at their meetings didn't even have enough to bring food. And part of that community of the church is that everybody's welcome here, right? Do you believe that? Everybody's welcome here. We have a friend named John Price, and he sent us a picture of, he did a funeral for one of the pagans, the motorcycle gang, the pagans, down the Jersey Shore. What do you think that would be like? The picture's in the parking lot. There was 150 bikers there with their leather jackets on and the pagan symbol on the back. And I mean, could you think of a more unlikely place for a preacher to be doing a ceremony? He would say something that they agreed with, and they'd drop F-bombs, like, yeah! And then, then they'd be cursing. But could God still touch them? Yeah. Well, of course! How many of you were that person? Maybe not in a motorcycle club, but some other way. I mean, the devil is an equal opportunity destroyer. He does it a billion different ways. He doesn't care what poison you drink. He just wants to poison you. And in the midst of that, the presence of God showed up, our friend said, because he tied it in to family. He said, the reason you're all here today is because this guy's a member of your family, and that's how God is. Wow. That's a Holy Spirit download, isn't it? Help, Lord. I need to be a very present help because I'm with a bunch of literal pagans as well as spiritual pagans. Nothing should scare us as God's people. You're good for one more por portion of scripture, okay? Daniel chapter 10. I alluded to it earlier. I just want to unpack a little bit more about that second heaven, right? Because that's what we're talking about. When we read in Corinthians, the war was in the second heaven, and it was manifesting in the first heaven in the way they were meeting with each other. There was a spiritual atmosphere of confusion over them, and they were making really bad decisions. And when you say, I'm going to win the war in the second heaven, you're saying, I'm going to still get the downloads from God, even though there's noise trying to deflect it. I'm going to be so tuned in through Holy Spirit that I'm not going to be shaken by all this confusion that's going on. It really takes a very sober-minded attitude to recognize there's a war going on against us. And it could be disguised as light. You know, we know that the Bible does that. So verse 2 of... Daniel chapter 10 says, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. How many days in three full weeks for you mathematicians? 21. 21, okay. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine, came into my mouth, nor I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. On the 24th day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, and I lifted my eyes and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with gold. His body was like the fine jewel beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like torches of fire. 
Who does that sound like? Yes, it does. Oh, it sounds like the description of him in Revelation, doesn't it? 21 days he's been praying. And all of a sudden, he sees an appearance. I'm just going to ask you, if you're feeling discouraged and you need a shot of encouragement, stand up right now. No shame in this. Okay? This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to get us discouraged. It's where Daniel was. He was grieving. He said there was a heaviness on me. If you, if you think about verse 1, I was mourning for three full weeks. And I've been, I mean, again, I'm not trying to compare myself to him. I'm just saying I know what this is like because I was thinking of my father who was a World War II veteran and people saying that we shouldn't celebrate the 4th of July anymore. Like, what? Do you realize the cost that people paid for the freedom that we have? And as a pastor of a church and the ability for us to congregate like this, and, and I'm not going to let that win. I'm going to fight back against that spirit. So for all of you that are standing, I'm just speaking God's strength to enter your system right now. Amen. And if you're around those people that are standing, just stretch your hand towards them, okay? And let's just believe God for a holy refilling of a time of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. That's what we're believing for right now. A very present help in time of trouble. That's who the Lord is. He's not far away. He's not distant from us. If it matters to us, it matters to him because he's a good father. Amen. And you know, the Bible talks about the sin of prayerlessness. And when we're tired, we don't pray as much. So we just speak life into you to be able to cry out to God. Daniel was fasting and praying for 21 days. And on the 21st day, which happened to be the 24th day of the month that we just read, he, get, he was given a download. Today's the 27th day of the month. It's the 37th days before the next election. And I just speak life and energy and power and peace. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And I just pray that the tank of your life, the fuel tank of your life is being refilled right now with the Spirit of God, with the presence of God, with the peace of God, that you will not be discouraged. In Jesus' name. We'll do one more thing at the end, but just turn around at 360 one more time and just say he's the God of the turnaround. All right, you may be seated. We got a mic here, Phil? Okay, thank you. This is also uh, at sundown, it's Yom Kippur. And this is a real holy time. And it's not just for Jews, we're spiritual Jews. And what we need to do, it's really important that we wait before the Lord. Hear his instruction for what he has for us in moving forward. God wants to give us individual downloads for our lives, for our destiny, for our purpose. So I just want to encourage you with that today, to, to really tonight and tomorrow, you know, it starts at sundown and then tomorrow, just wait before the Lord to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Amen? Amen. So I just want to pray too. So yeah. Lord, I just thank you that, that you want us to choose to rejoice. You know, one of the things that the Lord has helped me with is in Deuteronomy 28, I think it's verses 45 through 47 or 46 and 47. It says that He, the Lord said for us to, to worship him, to choose to worship him with joy and gladness. Because what happens is then an open door to the enemy comes. So every time I start to feel really stinky and you know, sad or hopeless or whatever, because we all get that way, I'll remember that scripture and I'll choose to rejoice yeah. whether I feel like it or not. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it really starts, and sometimes it takes a little longer, but I start warring and praying in the spirit, just worshiping, because he's given us tools to get out of that place. So I just want to encourage you with that. Amen. Just like I learned about prayer from my wife, you all can learn from her too, you know. <laughs> so Daniel 10, 7 says, remember, we, we stopped where it said he saw this vision of, of, a, of an angelic presence. It might have been Jesus, but he sees an angel at least. We know it's an angelic presence. It's a supernatural being who's with him. I alone saw the vision. The men who were with me didn't see it, but a great terror fell upon them. 
What do you think that was? It was the presence of God, and they knew it was there, but they didn't know what it was because the anointing was so strong. They fled and hid themselves, and they didn't know why other than they knew something was going on. There was a supernatural exchange that was happening. And verse 8 says, Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned into frailty in me, and I retained no strength. And that's all I'm trying to say. We're going to win the war of the second heaven, okay? That the, that's the thing that's trying to drain you of your peace and your strength. And if you're playing what-if games, unplug that game. Because we're not going to fully understand everything the Lord tells us to do. What if this? What if that? What if this? Guess what? That's an eternal game. You'll never stop asking, what if? You can't win. It's not logic. It's the voice of the Lord. And if you've got so much turmoil going on, but what if this? What if this? What if this happens? No. What about God? He said, my ways are high above your ways. You need to learn how to hear my voice. Once you hear my voice, you're not going to worry about what if. You're going to know what the Lord tells you to do. But you have to pursue that. You, it doesn't just happen. Okay? Sorry. It sounds like works. It's not. He wants a humble person. Think about the monsters that have been created that were anointed by God but were not humbled. How they misused the power and the anointing. Let me tell you, God loves you all too much. You're the flock of God. He doesn't want people up here abusing their spiritual authority. So it all starts with your knees. It starts on your knees. Lord, I know I need you. Yeah, and when you can do that, boy, I'll tell you, through Christ, you can do all things. Amen. <laughs> in your own strength, you create a lot of problems. You don't want to do it in our strength. Amen. Now, verse 10 is great. Because he just described he had no strength left. He was so washed out after 21 days of fasting and mourning. He was mourning for his people. He knew that it was sin that caused them to fall into the hands of the Babylonians. He was one of the Jews that was taken out of Jerusalem. As the city was being burned, he was taken out in cuffs. And he was made a slave. And he's just grieving now that sin caused all this problem. And he's interceding for his people and this man touches him. Suddenly a hand touched me, with me, made me tremble in my knees and on the palms of my hands. And, and verse 11, it says, he said to me, Oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved. Whew. Who's he beloved by? God. How many of you are beloved by God? So look at the person next to you say, Oh, whatever their name is. You are greatly beloved by God. Oh, that should make you shout. How do you know that? Because you're his child, and he's a good father. You don't ever have to call Dyphus on God. He loves me. I'm his favorite. Everybody say that. I'm his And it's all true. Whew. Greatly beloved God. My God, understand these words that I'm speaking to you and stand up right now. You got strength back because I just touched you. Stand up because I've been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, Daniel said, I stood trembling. And then the angel said, don't fear, Daniel. For from the first day, you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God. Your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. Amen. Oh, I've come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for how long? He's been fasting for 21 days. So see what happens if you give up too soon. The answer was on the way. You just quit too soon. Don't quit too soon. Grab the mic. Hey, we're, we're one. Two become one. because of his words what are your words what are you saying what are your decrees because we're in the era of pay 
So we shall decree that thing and it shall be established Woo. unto us. So that's why we Woo. need to be speaking what the word says, not yeah. with what you're feeling or what the world's saying. No. We decree that thing and it shall be established unto us. Amen. 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 You're greatly beloved by God. I came the first day you prayed and I've been in a second heaven battle trying to get to you and then it says in verse 13 so we know it was Gabriel right we know it was Gabriel that was speaking the one who touched him he says behold Michael one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left there alone with the king of Persia now I have come to make you understand what will happen to you you and your people in the latter days for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now think about this for a minute, okay? Daniel was going to get a download from heaven about the future of the nation of Israel. But he's a slave, and he's in this warfare that's going on. What would the devil want more than to stop the word from coming forth from this prophet's mouth? And he was willing to stay in prayer and wait until he got his answer. And then the angel comes to him and says, I've been sent from the first day you started praying. So your words is what brought me here. And now I'm going to give you the answer to what you were looking for. I'm going to give you the download. Now I'm not going to go into what the, all the download was. But we know that he got the download. Amen. It says, suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I, op oh, yeah, then I opened my mouth. Yeah. I just want to make sure I was in the right place. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to the one who stood before me, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. How can this servant of my Lord talk with you? No strength remains in me now, or is there any breath left in me? And then again, one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. Just lift your hand and receive the touch of the Lord. Why are we any different? We're beloved by the Lord. Every one of you is in a sphere that's different than every other person here. You can touch people that I can't ever touch. You have credibility with people I'll never even meet. So Lord, those of us that are lacking a little strength, we ask you, strengthen us right now. We want to be those ambassadors, that ecclesia that represents the kingdom of light in the midst of the darkness that's whirling all around us. And it says in verse 18, he touched me and he strengthened me. And he said again, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. Woo! This time to stand up now. When the Lord speaks to us, we get strengthened. Right? Yeah. I'm not telling you. I'm suggesting it. You do what you want. It's a free country. I want to keep it that way. <laughs> Whoa, the truth here is amazing. When the Lord touches us, we're strengthened. What a great reason to pray, to keep waiting for my download. Well, I have to work. Yeah, but you could still be asking the Lord while you're working to help you work better. There's no reason to stop interacting with the Lord at any time in your day. He wants to be there with you at all times. And then he finishes this last part by saying, Lord, speak to me, for you have strengthened me, and now I'm ready to receive the orders that you want to give me. Amen. And we've had some prophetic words that have come forth specifically today, but as a general rule for all of us, we're going to get a different assignment, aren't we? So can we just take a minute and lift our hands and say, Lord, I want my assignment. Even if I don't get it this minute, this day, I'm going to keep pressing in because I need to hear from you right now. I need to hear from you, from me, from my family, from my job, the people around me. I want to be a force for the kingdom of God, not hiding in a cave. Let's go back to that other floor. Maybe has a prayer. I really like that. So I'm just going to finish with a song that Danny started playing, and we can just speak it out. And I believe the Holy Spirit will will speak to us while we're singing it because it's exactly what we were praying about. And it's very easy. Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer, a house of prayer. Lord, make me a house, make me a house of prayer. It's 
that simple. Just close your eyes and look up and sing that out to the Lord. Lord, make me a house. Yeah, make it a prayer right now as you're singing those words. Don't just sing words to a song. I want to hear your voice, Lord. I want to know your will. And then it says, may the fire on my altar never burn out. Come on, say it. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire on my altar no, never burn. Let it never burn. Say, Lord, make me a house. You guys sound good. That's our prayer, Father, that you would fill us with your word. 